Welcome to the Hot Pot Insights Show. I'm Kunkit and I'm here to bring you the perspective and insights of extraordinary people in ordinary lives. A podcast for those who are looking to embark on a journey of discovery and growth. I would like to introduce our next guest. Among his long list of impressive credentials, such as an angel investor and TEDx speaker, he's best known as a co-founder and former CEO of Haba, Thailand's first co-working space and community that is the only Google for Startup partner hub in Thailand. In 2015, he co-founded TechSource, one of Southeast Asia's leading technology, media and events company that organizes TechSource Global Summit one of the biggest and top three best tech conferences in Asia. His passion for the startup community and to help entrepreneurs grow has led him to angel invest in many of the top Thai startups and actively coaches over a thousand different startups founders over the past decade. Because of his impact to the Thai startup ecosystem, he's recognized as an Obama Foundation Asia Pacific leader, a fellow of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, and has been named as one of Forbes Asia 30 Under 30 of the year 2016. Please welcome Amarit. Hello, and thanks for having me. Great, 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 great to have you on the show itself. Um, maybe can you share, share with us a bit more of your background? Like how do you um, came about with Haba, then going on to TechSource, as well as now, I think you mentioned earlier before the start of our call, uh, going into a bit more towards or going to more full time into angel investing. Uh, sure. So I'm a right now a co-working space and events uh, entrepreneur, um, but also a refugee. Uh, obviously, with COVID nineteen, we've been uh, forced to uh, right size and then really come to terms with this new normal, which is uh, less physical events, uh, less need for physical space. Uh, this year has been a amazing year, almost a mini sabbatical of sort for that allowed me to reflect on what I've been working on the past decade. So initially, I started my career straight out of college, and then, by the way, not a terribly great student, a, a two-time super senior. So I graduated late, late from both college and high school. Uh, so not the sharpest tool in the shed, um, and coming out with a sense of a lack of purpose and a lack of self-confidence and where do I add the most value. I graduated with an accounting degree, but had no idea uh, or no interest in practicing it. So long story short, I was given a chance opportunity to do some volunteer work in the Hill Tribes of Thailand. Fell in love with that experience, but felt that a calling of why can't I do this full time? Why can't I help people be better off, have better quality of life, be able to fulfill their dreams, um, be more healthy, have a better family, be more productive, and then get paid to do that. So that led me into uh, impact uh, and and running Thailand's first social enterprise incubator at a nonprofit called Change Fusion. That experience taught me that helping entrepreneurs is a fascinating journey. Uh, It's the chance to see everyone and various business ideas, journeys, dream emerge, but many times also die because entrepreneurship is very hard. Um, Through the two years in a nonprofit, we realized that grooming and growing the next social entrepreneur was very difficult. We did a lot of research why that was one of which led me to Hubba, which is there was a lack of collaborative workspace that was affordable, flexible for early stage entrepreneurs, but also had the chemistry, the magic of serendipity, where people would come and work together and learn from one another, help one another, invest in one another. And that was emerging in 2011 and 12, when I was really witnessing this boom. And in Asia, there was uh, globally, there was like 700 co-working space. There's probably like less than 20 in Asia, a few in Singapore. And I decided I want to ride that wave, be the first space in Thailand. So we set out to do it, not have 
never stepped foot in a co-working space before in my life, looked everything up in Google and decided that it wasn't rocket science. So here we are now, we built the space eight years, uh, at about four years in, we decided we were running too many events, started a technology media company to help promote our events and also promote Thailand, promote Southeast Asia, because we thought it was home. It was the destination that we were so proud and excited about, but nobody was hearing about it on TechCrunch or uh, all the other global publications. And so we started TechSauce in about in 2019, um, after almost a decade into the journey, the better founders on my team stepped up and said that they were going to take the company forward. Uh, and then that was the process. I started to pass the torch. And I think that was uh, coming back full circle was a, a chance to reflect and a reinvention. And I'm sure that's something you're going to dig into further, Kunkit, of yes, uh, what am I up to now? Definitely, definitely. I think maybe something very uh, uh, something that you brought up. I think is really cu curious. You mentioned that when when you got out after after you graduate, you had that lack of sense of purpose and and through um, um, through your journey through uh, giving back giving back to society, uh, uh, volunteering that sense. Like, is there any specific questions that you ask yourself that? Ask yourself to 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 look to find for your that, that that sense of purpose and to what are the actions that you took on like the immediate actions that you took on to act on it in that sense that's a great question because many times people just feel that oh you know i must be born this way there's like a you know social entrepreneur impact bone in me and i just get up and say this is what I want to do, but it's actually a, a, a process, a journey, because uh, I, I started with being a bit of a dreamer, a drifter, reading the stories of, of Richard Branson and all these great entrepreneurs, um, you know, in, in this generation would be Elon Musk, but yes. uh, back in the days, we fantasize and romanticize how often being the boss, being the decision maker, calling the shots would be. And nothing could be farther from the truth. It is, it's got its good days and a lot of uh, dog days. That said, I think one of the key things that is often asked by young people about me in, in finding myself is that a lot of young people say they don't have passion or they can do anything. They're interested in so many things. How do, where do I get started? And I. I often just tell them one thing, which is try as many things as you can be exposed to as many different options and career paths and way of life and talk to as many people. And over time, as, as you taste the different flavors out there, you know, you can start to narrow your search, pick the parts of each career, the bits that you like and just uh, tell and reflect, tell yourself that which parts are not suited for you, which parts don't get you up from bed, which parts is not something that you would wanna pursue for the next you know, 10, 10 weeks, or, or which parts you like now, but decided to give up later. And, and that massive exposure when I was coming up to that volunteer camp, most people don't realize I was doing a year at a management consulting company. I was working in a food stylist as an intern. I was trading stocks online. I was trying to sell stuff on e-commerce. So I, I had a plethora of different career options and I kind of narrowed my search and pick and, and through that serendipitous and very fortunate chance of that volunteer camp. That was when I realized that this was the path of, this was my mantra in, in life, that it was not even through working as a social entrepreneur or in the nonprofit, it was through just being exposed to volunteering. So 
once you kind of open one door, you know, many new doors emerge. Yeah, I, th I think this this really reminds me of a bit of myself as well. So um, I also do some volunteering. So I think through volunteering, it really give you a different perspective of the other side of society that might be experiencing something that you might never know of, you might never experience of. I think that gives a different insight and give is quite breathtaking in terms of where it can be some is it can it can spark some something in someone like yourself to to be able to give to want to give back to be able to give back or to look forward or to build something to cater to some part of society to to really enhance or for them to be able to gather together in some in some sense as well so so I, I really do know where you're coming from in, in maybe a certain perspective, but maybe not as grand as yours in, in, some, in, some, in that case. Well, um, I think touching on, on, on that, like has the experience from Haba bring, bring on to TechSource, uh, how has it brought, brought it to, to now currently, like in today, like what you're doing right now? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I, I always feel that careers are like layering the cake. You're, you're starting out with one and you're kind of building on top of one another consciously and not uh, just like Steve Jobs said, you know, over the years, you will, if you look hard enough, you could be able to connect the dots and see how these careers are interlinked. And I've been very fortunate to have been blessed by meeting amazing business partners and, and people that are givers, not takers for the most part. And to be able to continually be given opportunities uh, to, to try new things, to build upon my, my career. And, and through Hubba and, and Texas, what I realized is that, you know, I've, I've done events and community building and rallying people. I can do that in my sleep. I can do that anytime you know the, the joke is there's lights camera action and I've, I've been given a mic i can get up on the stage and make some magic happen now the challenges and also the, the the funny question i asked myself over the covid break was that so what do you really want to be in your life Aim? Uh, and and then that's the joke that I always tell people, which is I, I still ne never quite know or I'm sure. And I realize is I've mastered certain skills, but seeing the Thai tech ecosystem over the past 10 years, you know, we have only 30 something deals annually uh, out of maybe compared to Singapore, about 200 funded companies. And most of the companies that are funded are growth stage. Um, there's probably $350 million invested in the ecosystem this year, but 200 went to a logistics company. So I meet all my fellow brothers and sisters in the tech world who are struggling, who are laying off their staff, shutting down, who are burnt out. And I feel that my job is not done, but also I need to reinvent myself because what got, has gotten me here, what I was good at is great. People love it, but it may no longer be the right skill set or the only silver bullet to achieve my goal of, of making entrepreneurship the driving force for economic and social progress in Thailand. Uh, and while those skills have made me very famous, somewhat wealthy, uh, depending on, on uh, which uh, day you ask me, um, but also it can also lead to being stagnant. Sometimes you're doing the same thing over and over again and events just keep getting bigger and more complex. And with co-working space, you're going to add more locations and just host more people. It's amazing. There's a lot of people on my team do that really well. 
and they are excited to get up and write and host and you know uh, build conferences and I, I I love to support them but I'm saying that we also have to reevaluate what is the best use of our finite time and resource on this planet on this earth and where am I most suited where am i the critical lever point which if i do something in this space and where no other people are doing it will give me maximum leverage to achieve the goals i i am trying to set out to do so for me i felt that you know with co-working we've we've established a movement there's no shortage of co-working spaces in thailand and in the norwegian you know people are quite well aware and well versed so i'm very proud to have have launched that with tech conferences there's no shortage of amazing conferences online and offline and we continue to do so and then i guess the very hard question that i had to ask myself is so what's next for you how can you reinvent yourself to be more impactful and that was a very tough question because it meant I had to both examine my success, very few, failures, plenty, but also, you know, my, my strengths and weaknesses and what I actually want to do and where I actually want to grow. And some of those questions were very hard because it rips into the fabric of your identity. You've built, I've built myself into this co-working events guy. And now I have to say, well, is that really who I am or who I want to be for the next decade? Well, I think that's very deep. I think there's always, it, it really reminds me of, um, there are always phases in life. So uh, I think from one of the speaker is that um, whatever got you to your current phase or your, your current position, might not be the thing that brings you to the next phase. So I think that might be applicable to anyone who is in the very much in a growth mindset that you can always pick and choose uh, the silver linings as well as whatever you have learned um, from that, that, that current phase or the previous phase and to really apply it and move it on to be able to pivot uh, into the next phase as well. I think this is something that you have been experiencing and you have been asking yourself and, and really deep dive in, into how can you really um, better improve on impact and better bring uh, maybe even that sense, in, uh, in a sense, your voice to be able to reach out to more people, to be able to uh, be better provide value uh, to, to the people that you are working with. Um, I, I came across this uh, term um, uh, through a course itself. Uh, it's called the trim tap move. So, you know, that's like the, the, the ship um, at, at the end of the rudder, that this very small strip of piece is called a trim tap. So I think if, I see that you're nodding. I think I think that you you have you have heard of this this phrase before. So I think I think what you're looking for is like what are the cre the critical um, um, move that you can make to really make the biggest impact, um, be it socially, be it um, to your network, um, be it to your community. I think I think that's that's very um, grand of you. To, to, to look into that as well. Yeah, so maybe can you share us share with us like a bit more about your, your next move? Yeah, so uh, I, I think I I see where you're going, Kunkit, at the, the direction. And, you know, I think that's where a lot of people get wrong, which is they, they, they follow certain paths laid out to them. They succumb to family and social pressure. Oh, you're this age, you need to be getting this kind of job, making this kind of money. And, or, or sometimes they're just uh, FOMO. They're seeing a lot of people see their founder friends raise mega millions and they feel that they have to go out there in order to prove themselves that they're worthy. They need to get into a lot of debt. They need to put a lot of stress on them. It's great. I, I think for a lot of people that is a fair challenge if they're cognizant of what they're doing and why they're doing but many people just kind of do it because 
you know, uh, yeah, founders, we got a raise, we got a FOMO, right? So for a lot of people, like they, they can be very successful making a small business of one person or a small company that just generates a ton of profit. So, so I think once you kind of remove these paradigms and dogmas of if you're in technology, you must be a founder. You, the only way to become rich and successful is to be the CEO and or the C-suite, right? And I think having kind of taken a step back and see how hard, how stressful, how depressing sometimes uh, the entrepreneurship journey could be. You know, I've been given the, the opportunity of, of reflection um, and I've gone through my battles of anxiety and depression and sleepless nights myself. I, I realized that one of the things that got me through all those phases was this board member, Kuntiwa York, who really was there for this Haba team when, when we were really going through some of the toughest, darkest uh, challenges in, in our uh, existence. Obviously, you know, with last year, not, you know, the co-working world is in a tailspin thanks, thanks to WeWork. Uh, but on top of that, first time founders like myself, my co-founders, we many times don't really know what we don't know. We, we're, we're just kind of reading, listening, learning, trying, winging it. And I was blessed at Haba since the beginning of having known all the startup movers and shakers, the top CEOs of, of companies that have raised hundreds of million valued, you know, half, half a unicorn. And they sit on my cap table and my, my board and they give me these advice. And Tiwa is, is probably one of our smallest angel, but one of our most influential. And what I realized was that founders need to build a support network, whether it's their friends and family, it's their spouses and partners who are there to give them emotional support, sometimes financial support, many times actually. And oftentimes the clarity and the perspective of an outsider, of somebody who's not in the trenches, who's not stressed out, angry, down and give them the right guidance to say what to prioritize in, what is meaningful, what is not. Um, and, and while we were in this challenging period, within two weeks of engaging Tiwa, problems that we were having three, four months, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. And that was the gift of experience. And I was mind blown, like, wow, why didn't I engage my angel, my mentor, my coach really sooner? And then I reflected on that with all the other startups I now invest in and like, wow, so many of them are just literally going out at this crazily stressful journey with no backup on their own, winging it with their last amount of money that they've got and they're going to make it or crash and burn. And that's why the, the failure rate in the industry is so high because I was spoiled by these mentors. I could call literally anybody up in the Thai tech ecosystem and ask for help. Other founders, they literally had to beg people to ask for dinner or coffee or to pitch them and that. So I said, well, there's something about it. I, I'm blessed by this opportunity. Can I give back in this way? Because I was doing it already. It's mentors with accelerators that I run for other people, but I wasn't really quite sure about myself, whether I had something to give. And 
through a little bit of introspection, it wasn't that I didn't have anything to give, you know, the d- decades of experience, the, you know, 11,000 people on LinkedIn and, and nine other on Facebook. It's, it's not just the network, but it's the access and ability to actually say like, you need to talk to this person. You need to, talk. I, and I, I was able to fix things. I was able to see many patterns from talking to a thousand founders but I wasn't confident in myself. I didn't see myself as worthy of being a coach and a founder, as I always thought it was always someone on the other side coaching me that had a big exit and had a lot of money that have these infamous companies. And that mindset shift came during COVID and I, I said, well, you know what? Maybe you're wrong. You know, you're always thinking that Hubba and Texas is not a finished product yet. The perfectionist that I am, you know, like we've got still got a long way to go. We haven't raised mega millions. We haven't conquered Asia, conquered the world, right? We're, we're stuck in this rut this year and this really write off of a year of 2020 because of COVID. But rather than me thinking i decided to give it a shot so got really serious in mentoring and then working with the founders in in my portfolio many of which i share with tiva and, and many of the top angels in thailand and guess what it became clear that people kind of like what i'm saying uh so i kind of rediscovered a superpower in me that I never saw in myself. But it took a little bit of a break. I needed that clarity and headspace and not freaking about out and about of keeping the lights on, finding the next mega deal, raising the next big check, and really to zen out and see. So what what are the gifts that I have developed beyond what I can see? And how can I turn those into a viable career and a business? And being an executive coach is one and, and being an angel investor is just kind of links with that because as I'm coaching, I'm looking at some of the best companies and uh, David Cohen, the CEO of Techstars, recently got, got on a call with the top community leaders in Asia. And I asked him one pointed question, which is, you know, we've been doing this for a decade, barely making ends meet most of the time, not really taking care of ourselves and not seeing the light of how I can actually make it big and, and become successful as a community builder, right? Co-working and events aside, I'm. I am just helping and helping and helping, but I don't feel like I'm winning. And he said to everybody in the call, I said, well, you know, the next big thing for community builders is you got to invest. You can't just be part of the story of the success of these future unicorns and game changers. You have to be in the story, you have to be integral to the success. And well, that sounds like no duh, like, yeah, you should like, well, besides like, do you have the money to do it? I think a lot of people weren't confident in themselves or haven't really articulated them to themselves before they tell other people their value and what they could add and what gifts it can bring. And that challenge stopped us a lot of, of community leaders to, to angel invest because we just feel like we don't have the money or the means to be an angel investor advisor. And when I flipped the switch over the course of the year and said, well, you, you know what? There are way less qualified people angel investing and stuff, giving really bad advice or not helping at all. And why can't I be that angel investor that was so that is so missing in Thailand? 
literally there. There's no active angel syndicates that we know of. And there's only a pocket of, of clusters of great mentors and angel investors that are, are co-investing together. And, like, and I say like, why can't I be that guy or, or lady? Why, why not me? Why do I always feel that we're stuck in this identity of community builder, co-working guy, media guy? And what's stopping me? Oh, it's just myself. I'm just telling myself that I'm not rich. I'm not worthy. And then when I flip the switch, they're like, well, find money. Blends it into some startups. It can be small check and then help the startups find more money. And you're an angel investor. What's, what's wrong with putting a thousand dollars here or there or ten thousand dollars here or there it's not big chuck but you can be instrumental in helping them to raise a few hundred thousand or a million dollars so so the inner game my summary is the inner game is something that founders know that they need to work on but they don't prioritize it they don't make time for it so that's why they're stuck Got it. I think you mentioned about inner game and uh, I think even before that, like there were bad advices out there in, in the market um, from other angel investors. So if any founders or startups who are listening to this, to this episode, is there any advice that they should avoid? Well, they got to pick who they listen to very well. I mean, you know, there's going to be a lot of signal to noise, uh, you know, mentors you meet in accelerators and people casually showing up on LinkedIn and your co-working space. Uh, but find the ones that really have a deep invested in emotional connection with you. Mean well, just, just love what you do, but also has the right experience the perspective of your business, it can, it can be coming from a different industry. Like Tiva is from the e-commerce industry, but he is a community leader by heart and soul. Um, so he gets what we're doing, even though he brings in a fresh pair of eyes, right? And I'm really going to deep end with some of these people, you know, you could, you can have a network, you know, five, 10 advisors that you rely on from time to time, but you've got to develop some chemistry with your coach, somebody you, who you really, it's the kind of guy, like if something goes really wrong, don't tell your wife, don't tell your business partner, you tell this person first that close right and and i think one of the bad advice i hear a lot is that you know it's it's okay you're gonna you're gonna fail you're gonna you know just gotta keep doing it you gotta believe in yourself and and fail failing is is this part of of the experience I think that's obviously true. But what if you can learn from other failure? What if, if you can have somebody to say like, you can try this, but if you mess up, then let's talk about it. Why? What did you learn? Right? As many times founders, they go by their gut, by what they read, by what their peers tell them to do, they make some decisions but they are not learning. So failing without learning, failing without that accountability of, of assessing what went wrong, how to fix it, how to do better is many times fatal to the company. And oftentimes founder deprioritize that because they don't want any bosses. They don't want any people telling what not to do. They don't 
feel like they need to be accountable to anyone. Guess what? The best founding teams that need to raise their Series A or B, they all need a board of director. They all need somebody to be that person and on the seat at the uh, and the head of the table to give them guidance and support to open doors to help them closer. That is often unsaid in the tech world of how much work it takes behind the scene. And when founders ignore, deprioritize having that bench of, of advisors and board directors, somebody they can rely on um, just because it's, uh, we, we can deal with it later. And uh, maybe we don't have the money or the time to, to find one. For whatever the excuse, it hampers them to raise their next round. It hampers them to make good decisions. Uh, and, 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 and when they, the boards do work and do really well, they are the winds beneath our wings. One, one of the startups that I invested in with all the godfathers and mothers of the Thai startup world, Seekster was badly affected uh, during COVID. On-demand cleaning, air conditioning, cleaning, home cleaning services. They've got a um, manpower management SaaS, as well as a few other tools within their, their, their company. But, you know, bookings crashed and they were in dire need of capital injection and not sure what the right strategy is. They're not sure how to continue to fundraise and, and grow the business. They, they, they weren't sure all the team and, and the morale and everything. And all these super angels, we get over to dinner and they were punching it above their way. They were bringing in the big guns, Tiva, myself, boy and Scooter, um, Ted, Deputy MD at, at a, one of the holding companies that own Thailand's largest telco. And it's not just the network or uh, the gift of foresight and experience, but just having the presence in the room lifted the spirits of the team. And they break down through all the walls, believe in themselves when again, got themselves to a really good place in the balance sheet and are optimistic in 2021, you know, come what may to grab life by the horns. I mean, that, and then contrasting that with my personal experience of, of doing that badly. And I'm like, I know this is a game changer. I know this is something that emerging market founders, you know, I think maybe this is something pretty common in, in Singapore, more, more mature ecosystems, but in Thailand and in Indonesia and Vietnam, you know, angel investing, executive coaching, being on that board, being that 12th man on the pitch, that's a game changer and nobody's doing it well. So I would say that if founders were serious about becoming top notch, becoming really ready for investment, they need to build that support network, that ecosystem, that community around them to propel them to where they need to go. Oh, that, that's, that's quite deep. So uh, what I'm hearing you that having mentors, having the network, having someone that you can bounce ideas, get feedback, uh, get a pushback, get, a, get that, that oomph to, to keep you going. I think that's, that's really important. Um, I think along this, this conversation, you have brought up a few times on touching on the topic of faith. having failures is important in the journey of any entrepreneurs. On that, on, on, on that note, is there any specific failures that of, of your personal favorite uh, that, that really have brought you um, to a higher success afterwards? There's too many to count, 
Um, uh, one that comes to mind right now is that I have always been somebody who has a an enough for a grand vision and running to, you know, uh, as Richard Branson put it, um, building, you know, dream of the impossible and try to make reality match it, right? Um, whatever that quote was, the idea was always uh, as, as Iron Man uh, in, in, in the first, First Iron Man, he said that sometimes you need to be able to run before you can crawl, as he was building Mark I of the Iron Man suit. And I think that's many times what, what founders feel. Um, but as you're running, you need to also realize that there is finite energy, finite mental focus, finite strength and help and and time in a day and one of the, the big failures that i wish if i knew and i knew it but i didn't care so much about it was that i never really you know i, I put 100 percent in in work and everything out around my life graph whether it's health play spirituality um, and uh, family was almost like everything around me was supposed to serve work. But when I was over-focused on work, working 16 hour days, sleeping at 4 a.m. and not you know, going to the co-working space for events on a Saturday and a Sunday, staying till 10 or midnight to host the event, it, it wears you down without knowing. And it makes you with lack of sleep, extreme stress and anxiety, you make bad decisions. You are easily agitated. You are always blurred. You come to the meetings fuzzy and, and thinking about the previous meeting and planning for the next meeting and filling those calendars, uh, trying to be Elon Musk and filling them with 15 minute slots with barely a toilet break. I think there are reasons why some people are, are superhuman and they're geniuses and they, they become you know, the godfathers uh, of the, and mothers of the tech, tech industry, the Titans. But we also have to be realistic that that that's all of us are, might not reach that level and that's okay. We could be building a $10 million company, $100 million company. And other things may be our priority, our health, our relationship with our spouse, time with family. And I have aging parents. I have a brother who just passed away due to a heart attack. Um, so we barely see it. each other. And I, I had plans to start a family with my wife and we keep postponing it because I'm too stressed out and you know, it doesn't help if money woes and you know, it, it just no, no longer interested to, to make any babies because you're always thinking about your other baby, which is the company. And you know, you, you, your weight goes, you have ingrained weight, like 10 kilos while I'm in the tech community lost a few and yo-yo up and down. I'm not constantly exercising and going to the medical checkup to see my cholesterol level rising, knowing which that there is a history of a heart condition in my family. At some point during the sabbatical, I said, well, you know what, what, what is meaningful to life? Is success in the company really require you to give up everything and is giving it up too much and some of the things that you give up will it ever you know will it be too late 
to regain them, you know, like time with with your parents that are aging and whatnot. And I think at some point we have to be somewhat realistic of what we want in our lives and that measure of success is not just the biggest event in Asia and the best event in Asia or the largest network of co-working space in Thailand. And that's okay. We're going to make a great business. We're going to serve people well, raise funding, keep growing. But I think the, the realization that having spent all this time and not taking care of all the other things that are part and parcel, health, love, family, spiritual, all are in service of the business was a realization that in order to do my work well, I needed to know how to pause, know how to slow down, know how to appreciate dinner with family and coffee with friends. Friends that I, I have in Bangkok, I meet less than the people I meet in tech conferences. And that's not okay, right? And uh, when I did that, I, my life became a lot better. I was making better decisions. I was more, I have more energy, I have more optimism in life. I have less things on my plate, but when they are, I have more focus and mental energy to tackle them. And that all comes with coaching. So my practice of coaching was actually, I'm coaching myself first to be a better entrepreneur and a supporter before I go out and coach other people. So what are those set of questions that you ask yourself to be reflective to, to make that change? Well, I think there's a classic Clayton Christensen um, lecture uh, and the question is how, how will you measure your life? And what is the, the metric of success, not just on a monetary or business perspective. That really, are you trying to be an incredible dad, a great son, a active member of society, of the community you live in, and the business? No, at some point, Maybe I'm a late bloomer, right? I've got two businesses that did okay, but a lot of people, life starts at 35, 45, and they become gray hairs and seasoned pros. Who knows? Uh, and and, and I, I just feel that if, if I've done things right by people, by those that love me and, and people around me, that I stick to my values, that I give first, give back, give often. And these mantras in life have got me to where I am today. And they're my winning strategies to get me to where I'm going. Well, I don't quite know what will end up of my angel investing and coaching career. Could I start another startup? Possibly. Could I pivot into a venture capitalist? We'll see. Could I go out and do something completely different? You know, maybe go sailing around the world, or <laughs> become a psychologist or crazy founders. But I believe that the inputs is right. Got great karma, great support from friends and family and working on myself to be the best version, the better version of me constantly. There's some down days, there's some relapses, but constantly working towards being better, being more ready, and always maintaining that energy and optimism that I can do it. If other founders 
can do it, so can you. You just haven't found that rocket ship yet. You haven't found that calling yet. And, and just keep swinging at the path. Right. It takes seven to 10 years to build a tech company. All of us have probably three to four tries. I'll keep swinging my bat, but with angel investing, you can invest in hundreds of companies and support other people to take a swing and hopefully help them improve their odds of hitting, hitting a home run. So uh, that's where I'm at today. And, you know, check up on me in another month and things might have changed. Sure, we will do, we will do, definitely. Yeah, I do, I do have a, a quick question for, for you is that for any budding entrepreneurs, right? Which of these two might be more important? So having the passion or having the credentials? I think some, some people will say passion is overrated. Um, I think sometimes they're right. Uh, you know, not everybody's passionate. I have found out uh, from my many interactions with them. They may have expertise, they may have found a calling. They might not be super excited what they do. It, it does help to have that initial burst of energy to get out there and, and put yourself on the line. But sustained motivation is, is probably harder to come by. To stick with the problem seven to 10 years, that's probably where you really have to align your life goals, your work goals, and the problem space that you're doing. And there's gotta be somewhere there a reason. You're either pissed off or traumatized or found something that you just feel like nobody's doing, I gotta do it. It's calling to me. And that, that story, that reason of being sustains you and the passion will, may fade, may go in and out depending on the, the day of the week. But that reason of being that why is, is what's going to sustain you. And I feel that credentials and experience, you can always get it anywhere. You can always build it as long as you put yourself out there. You might not feel like people, a lot of people ask me, they want to be a venture capitalist. They want to be a founder. What do they need to do? So I tell them like, have you talked to other founders? Have you went to any events? Have you gone to a hackathon? Have you read any books? Have you listened to some podcasts? Have you hang out with people who actually have done it before and work with them, volunteer for them, intern with them? invest in it. And as long as you dip your toes and with intentionality and commitment, say like, I want it, I want this. I'm interested to do this. A lot of people will, will be willing to give you a shot. And uh, credentials can be built. That's how I built. I have a long, a lot of people say too long list in my LinkedIn. But it was just, I'm, I'm a professional dabbler. Everything's interesting. I get in, I help out. Might be a short contract, might be for a few years. But the experience and the network I've built, I can now go and share with people that I understand the recruitment business and medical cannabis and building and uh, expanding businesses into Thailand uh, and, and working with the UN, right? So. I'm not qualified to do any of those jobs. I just say that I don't know, but I'll figure it out. I think I can. And people say, no, you can do it. And you know, the rest is history. Yeah. So I guess it's really to just try it out and, and see where it takes you. Yes. Um, been the story of my life failing forward. I hope uh, everybody who's listening to this call let you know that behind 
all the accolades, the fellowships, the companies have built is a constant perpetual failure artist who continues to uh, not know what he wants in life or who he wants to be, constantly reinventing, constantly learning, constantly asking tough questions to himself and questions to everybody around him of where the puck is going to be. All right, I think we can move on to our quick fire questions. So the questions can be, the questions are short, but your answers can be either short or long, really depending uh, up to you. So number one, what is your favorite word? It's kind of cheesy and I, I like the word aim. I, my nickname means a lot to me. And, and I think people should be goal driven. And if they have clarity of where they're headed, there's so much power and energy and momentum in whatever they do. Even during monkhood, add a name to Zen out. And when I did, it was the most peaceful time in my life. So that's the name of my blog, The Aim is the Way. And I feel that this word, I couldn't have not been more blessed with uh, another nickname. All right. So second question is, what are you most curious about right now? I'm most curious about high performance entrepreneurship. I felt that working with my buddy who's a athlete and a business coach, we treat ourselves as just players, CEOs, entrepreneur in this corporate machinery, this startup, this thing, and we're just going along for the ride. He's given me insight to see that, you know, this is a very long game and you need to train yourself as if you were going to run in a marathon. That means everything, eating, sleeping, mentally, physically, skills wise, always, always recalibrating, assessing, adjusting yourself to the circumstance. And, and when I took that view of entrepreneurship, that is why if you see me on my LinkedIn, I'm taking all these courses, I'm going to all these programs and talking to all these people because I am practicing what I'm preaching, high performance entrepreneurship. All right, so I know you love to travel. What is your go-to food when you reach back home in Bangkok? Uh, that is a good one. Um, well, actually, I, I, if, I, if I'm in Japan or, or the US for over a week, I'll start having cravings for Thai food and eat. Uh, there's literally a, a trip of, of three weeks. And by the second week, me and my buddies, we were eating in a Thai restaurant once a day. Um, but yeah, I crop pao kai, kai dao, or, you know, chicken, minced chicken, stir fried with basil and a fried egg. Um, that is probably, you know, besides tom yam kung and som tam and, and pad thai, this is kind of the go-to Thai traditional dish. So easy to make, it tastes amazing. A lot of chilies. Um, yeah, and, and, and you know, I think our, our unique Thai fry egg should be more well-known and synonymous. It is one of a kind. It is, it is. Is this the same as your go-to comfort food? Pretty much. And any anything on a street food with some Hawker stands, you know, uh, it's going to be amazing. Stir fried kale, um, you know, and, and, and crispy pork. Oh my goodness. Uh, that's it. Like 
a one two dollar dish is sometimes I, I eat a lot of these chef tables and, and fancy dinners that cost like three hundred four hundred dollars. Sometimes I'm just wondering, like, you know, man, I, I just want to walk out here and go have this street food meal and, and save all this money. But, you know, sign of the times, right? Everybody wants a private chef. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I think next one is how do you do with doubt? I think the only way is to to try and see and focus on why you're down in the first place. Every day I w- wake up and I know like, can I build this pitch deck? I'm getting it. I'm given this opportunity. Can I actually deliver it? And because the task is ambiguous, we're not quite sure we're going to succeed. Then we procrastinate. We're like, ah, eh, I don't really want to think about it right now. It seems very com- complicated. The way to deal with it is how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So the idea is, you know what? Let's just build build some slides. Let's write the first 500 words. Let's do the first research and go read some 10 blogs and slowly build your confidence. And then to know that doubt and nervousness is really a sign of you just worried of not doing a great job and not really a reflection of who you are and having the right mentality to say, okay, yeah, well, we're, you know, you might not be able to do it. It's fine. But that growth mindset of failure of like, well, yeah, we're doubting. We could fail. We could embarrass ourselves. We could make us feel bad about us, but I'm going to learn something. I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to try baby steps one step at a time and nothing can kill me. Nothing can hurt me. Nothing can make me feel bad about who I am. And all I can do is learn and grow. Then you're going to be on your path to greatness. Right. Next one. Is there a routine that you follow? Be it morning routine, evening routine? Yeah, I think the mornings are now moved to the evenings. I do um, a lot of reading, and I think that's a secret superpower of most founders, the the gift of learning from other people's mistakes and successes uh, is all encapsulated in podcasts and blogs. So I'm reading... I'm listening to one blink a day on Blinkist. I'm not getting commissions for this. Um, audible. And sometimes I do a power power read, which is I listen to an audible and read on Kindle to double the intake, you know, multi-sensory reading and and blogs like information or strategy you know, really insightful reading for the tech world and then many others. Um, I, I do a lot of personal wellness uh, routine, meditating, some good apps like Headspace or I use Balance and Insight Timer as well to really decompress uh, and meditate and a bit of yoga. Uh, have my own stretching routine. And sometimes if I have more time, there's some good YouTube instructors like yoga with Adrian. But the idea is to have, as somebody who's been not very focused, is to have time to focus internally and and build on those focus and productivity muscles. Uh, It's super important. And then it's worked wonders for me. Uh, And then even exercising, I got into swimming, and have a treadmill besides my my workstation. Um, but I think he and you know I have relapses. Some sometimes I'm I'm out of it for a few weeks. But key to it is doing a little bit every day. 
and we continue and adding a little bit more minutes, try a little harder because what you do every day becomes a habit and what that habits manifest to become who you are. So if you want to have more focus and, and clarity and headspace, what are you going to do to, to fix it, right? And then the best way to work on it is don't, you don't need fancy courses and expensive coaches and online classes. Use the tool that you have, but do it every day. And the pro tip would be to do it with friends. Ask your best buddies, what are they using? What are they working on? Go to the gym together. Meditate and talk about it with one another, right? Because that way you get to really feel that, that community spirit and have other people keep you accountable. All right, next one, I think is more towards uh, budding entrepreneurs. Is there, is there any universal skill or habit that they should learn or pick up? Learning really fast. I think a lot of us in the tech world, we never imagine all the stuff that we need to do, like digital marketing and reporting to investors and term sheets and you know, setting up people, culture and, and, and uh, fundraising and you know, building your tech team and tech stack and blah, 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 blah. So the best founder I've had the fortunate chance to join his cap table as an advisor, Torkrop and the founder, Far. His secret power is if he needs to do something, rather than hiring an expert or waiting for somebody to do it, he'll read about it, get to 80% proficiency. He's not gonna be an expert, but he's gonna read it overnight or in a few days, and then he'll try it out and then he'll teach someone. But the idea is you can't be waiting around. You can't always be waiting for somebody to hand you a template or to mentor and guide you. Take whatever tools you've got, run with it, fix it, but get to enough proficiency to be able to just do it. Because the other 20% may be amazing, but that's, that's really the optimization. That's when you really need to become an expert and, and get into the weeds to get the most of your ROI on your ad spend and you know, making your website load two seconds faster and making sure that retention is amazing. And that's great, but as founders, we might not have the luxury of going super deep, but we, we might be deep at something, but we need at an early stage to be able to go super wide when needed. Because if you're not, if you don't do it, who's gonna do it? All right, so the last question for this quick fire round will be if you can have dinner with any three people, either dead or alive, who will it be and why? Well, I had met one already, but I wish I had more time with him. It was just President Barack Obama. Um, his view on how he came to office as a community leader and as an activist in Chicago was mind blowing. And to be in his presence, uh, gives me the goosebumps. He is a statesman true and true and the, an orator of immense caliber. You might not really agree with his politics, but he's very charming, very convincing, and he moves people. I would say the second buddy before he gets too old is, is Sir Richard Branson is still a hero and he's been through a lot, especially COVID with Virgin Atlantic and all the airlines. But I feel that he epitomes the classic entrepreneurial success of, of the heydays of, of, of the, the 90s, which I grew up in. And it, it would mean a lot to me to, 
to learn from him and then how he's reinventing himself with the Virgin Galactic, with all the challenges in the business. How, how would somebody in their, their 60s and 70s reinvent themselves in the digital age? It's definitely fascinating. And I guess the last person I'd love to meet, I hate to say it's Elon, but definitely, no, I might change that. Um, I would say that I would love, I probably not, I won't go with the investor. It's too cliche. Um, so the third person I would like to meet uh, and he passed away not so long ago, but I've um, been really inspired by this book. Somebody gave me The Trillion Dollar Coach by Bill Campbell, you know, as a ex-CEO of many, many amazing tech companies, turned coach of Steve Jobs and Larry and Sergey, Eric Schmidt, and all these amazing Silicon Valley titans. I feel that as I'm going through this journey as a coach and an angel, it just feels like the right person to talk to in this moment. Like, I just want to learn how he does it. Because I know founders, including myself, can be very headstrong, sometimes very sure of ourselves, and many times the blind spot and the Achilles heels are at the same time, the superpower. We are many times flawed geniuses and very hard to be able to convince somebody with such a drive an ego, not for me, but for many others. I know it's totally a very big personality and ego. How do you, coach the best entrepreneurs in the world and get them to call them your coach. And that's a journey I'm going through. And I hope that one day I will not be able to fill Bill Campbell's shoes, but I hope to be able to be behind some of the few successful stories that will be coming out of Southeast Asia and, and Thailand. That's great to hear. Thanks, Aim. Time really fly by. Just a last one. Where can the audience find you online if they would like to follow your journey or reach out to you? I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram. I am super easy to reach. Uh, it's at aim amarit. Uh, and you can just uh, send me a message if you like this podcast. If you'd like to work with me or know more, if you'd like to pitch me, I am here to serve the tech company communities and com uh, companies, not just in Thailand, but across Asia. And I look forward to elevating founder and entrepreneurship as a high performance endeavor as a career as a way of thinking and living uh, over the next decade. Great. Thanks, Ian, for your time. Thank you so much. Likewise. Hey, thank you for listening to my interview with Amarit. Here are my takeaways. One, put myself out there, read, listen, meet people, volunteer, and experience all things under the sun to better understand myself and what drives me. Two, build my support network to be able to reach out when I need such support, to get clarity and a different perspective of outsiders. Three, failing forward while improving myself. Even if currently I do not know what I want to do in life, be always consistently reinventing myself, learning and asking tough questions do let me know your takeaways from this hot pot mix of insights. Cheers.